This is the fourth section of chapter 13 on integration and this section is on definite integrals. Now definite integrals allow us to find the area under curves but in this section we're just going to focus on the actual process of finding a definite integral. Okay so I've written this statement down here I'm going to go through it step by step so we know exactly what we need to do. Well, the first thing we'll recognize this part here. So this part means to integrate this function with respect to x, because we've got the integration symbol, and that is this part here. So that's what we've been doing before. We integrate whatever this expression is, and we'll get this. But there are two new things here, these like letters. Now these are gonna be numbers. This number at the top, we call the upper limit and this value at the bottom we call the lower limit. Now these two numbers, they appear again over here. Once we've integrated this function, we then put it into square brackets to say, well, I've integrated this function. I'm now going to be doing something with these numbers here. Now what we then do with those numbers is we substitute each of those numbers in turn into this function that we've integrated and once we've done that we then do a subtraction so i substitute this upper limit this upper value into this integrated function and work it out i'll get a number i then in uh, substitute this lower value into this function and i'll get another value here and then i do the first value minus the second so when we substitute in this upper limit we put it into here we're going to get a number and then we'll substitute in this lower limit and they get substituted into here and we get this value here and then we're going to subtract them and then we're going to end up with a number so you'll end up with some sort of constant uh, when you're finished and this whole thing here is called the fundamental theorem of calculus and this process this fundamental theorem allows us to work out what we call definite integrals when we have numbers here when we have an upper limit and a lower limit this is no longer just called an indefinite integral it's called a definite integral so definite integrals have limits so basically the steps are integrate substitute then we get an answer integrate make sure we write it in square brackets with these limits then substitute those limits in then we get an answer and it's always subtract here. The upper limit substituted in minus the value we get when we substitute in the lower limit. Example seven, we want to evaluate this here. So let's write this out. So we've got an upper limit of one and a lower limit of zero. Right, so the first thing that we need to do this needs to be in a form that we can integrate. So we're going to expand those brackets first of all. So we write the rest the same. We don't change that for now. So maybe we'll do the working for it up here. X to the power third minus one, X to the power third minus one. So let's expand those brackets. So X to the power third times X to the power third. Effectively, we add the powers. So X to the power two thirds. Then we're going to subtract x to the power third minus another x to the power third and then plus one so we can simplify that x to the power two thirds minus two lots x to the power third plus one so we'll put that in here so x to the power two thirds minus two x to the power third plus one dx so now we do the integration. We're now going to integrate this. Now, when we integrate it, we put it in square brackets. And at the end of the square brackets, we do it here. We're going to still put these limits in because we need to substitute them in. That'll be our next step. So first term, x to the power two thirds, add one to the power. So that becomes five over three divided by five over three. Then the second term, minus 2x add 1 to the power so that now becomes 4 over 3 over 4 over 3 uh, plus 1 so remember that just becomes 1x or just x 
and we write one and zero. Now at this point, we would normally simplify this and that will be our final answer. But in this case, we don't need to because we're going to be substituting numbers in. Now I'm just going to do it just to make it look a bit tidier, but you don't need to actually simplify it, but it may be actually slightly easier to substitute our numbers in when we put it in on our calculator. Right, so dividing by five over three is the same as multiplying by three fifths. And then we've got two divided by four thirds, which will give us three over two. So minus three over two, x to the power of four thirds plus x. And then the zero and one, which we're gonna substitute in. So now we're on to the last step. So we substitute one into this. So three fifths times by one to the power of five thirds minus three over two times by one to the power of four over three plus one. So that's the one substituted in and I subtract exactly the same thing, but with zero substituted in with the lower limit substituted in. So three fifths times by zero to the power of five over three minus three over two times by zero to the power of four over three plus zero. Now you can probably see that all of that lot's gonna become zero anyway, but I'm just doing it so that you can see the process and the same thing with these powers. These are all gonna be ones anyway, so this is unnecessary, but it, it's, it's really good practice just to write your working out, even though you know it's gonna be zero or one. So from the first bracket, we'll end up with three fifths minus three over two plus one and then from the second bracket well it's all going to be zeros isn't it so i'll just put zero minus zero plus zero don't really need to so all we need to do is to work out this part and we've evaluated this indefinite integral or this definite integral and that'll lead us with uh one tenth as the final answer now, I want you to notice something that's missing from this question that's been in all the other previous indefinite integral questions we've done, and that is the constant plus C. Do you notice in this whole process, there is no plus C? So when we do definite integrals, there is no plus C. So with definite integrals, there is no really important plus c there is no constant of integration and there never will be when you have limits and you'll always get a numerical answer at the end example eight given that p is a constant and this integral this definite integral between five and one all of that is equal to four p squared show that there are two possible values for p and find their values. Okay, so here we're given the value of the integral. So the only, only unknown is p, and we should be able to find p. So our integral between the limits of five and one is two px plus seven, and we're integrating it with respect to x. So put it in square brackets. The p you think of as a number, so this will be 2p x add one to the power divide by the new power then the seven becomes seven x and that's between the limits of five and one we can tidy up the two divided by two and that will just give us p x squared plus seven x between the limits of five and one so let's evaluate that now we know in the question its value is 4p squared. So we'll look at that in a moment. So let's do the substitution now. So we will have p times by five squared plus seven times by five. So that's the five substituted in minus, always minus, p times by one squared plus seven times by one. Now, what does that give us? Well, we're gonna get 25p plus 35 from the first bracket then from the second bracket we'll have minus p and then minus 7 
Now that simplifies to 24p plus 28. Now we know that equals 4p squared. So we've got 24p plus 28 equals 4p squared. That's going to be a quadratic we want to solve. So 4p squared minus 24p minus 28 equals 0. We'll divide everything by 4 to give us p squared minus 6p minus 7 equals 0. We'll now factorise that. Hopefully it should be able to factorise. And we want 7, so it can only be 7 and 1. And we want minus 6, so we want minus 7 and plus 1. So that gives the value of P as either 1 or P is negative 1 or P is 7. So we've completed the question, show that there are two possible values of P and find these values. So there they go. So the values of P, negative 1 and 7. So you should now be able to do exercise 13D on page 297.